We're live? Yes. Oh, there's that live button. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, hello. It's Tuesday. It's uh, uh, 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern. That would make it 1 o'clock in the morning in Italy, but it's 5.30 in the morning here in India. Uh, we're in India, and uh, 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 we'll talk about that, but our special guest today is Dr. Alan Christensen, my good friend, Dr. Alan who is in Arizona. So it's five o'clock for you. Is that right, Alan? You're exactly right. Yes, yes. Well, hello and welcome. And thanks for being here with us today. Hey, Tom. Always a pleasure to hang out with you. Any excuse for that's good for me. <laughs> well, I, I fully agree. And for those of you that are joining us or just um, um, hearing about Dr. Allen for the first time, this is the guy who has been carrying the message out about our metabolism, about the adrenal glands, how important the adrenal glands are, about thyroid function. Um, I think you've written one book on thyroid, is that correct? Well, two on thyroid and yeah, one on the adrenals and now this on metabolism, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, so uh, uh, it's really wonderful. New York Times bestsellers and um, way to go, Dr. Allen, way to go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, if you're out there, I think I've got, let, let me look at my phone here. And so, you know, I'm tech savvy at this stuff. I think I know how to do it now. <laughs> oh, there it is. Right. I am here. And uh, uh, Gabrielle is here. And oh, there's already a, a bunch of comments. So thank you, everyone. We'll get to it. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, who is first? Carol Green. Uh, Carol's in Murrieta. And uh, Honor is in Wales. Lynn Johnson in South Australia. Wow. Tracy's in Florida, Kristen's in Chicago, Wanda is on Long Island. She says, hi, Dr. Tom and Dr. Allen with a big hearts and hi, Wanda. <laughs> yes, uh, so I've got to turn the volume down on my phone here. There we go, that makes it between, better. Between us and them, we've all got the globe covered, huh? That's right. That's right. <laughs> and Scott Larkin's joined. Hey, Scotty, good to see you here, man. Thanks so much, thanks so much. So Alan, um, first thing, my, my first question to you, I know that we're gonna talk about a resetting of the metabolism. So um, first, what, what is our metabolism? For people that don't know quite what that word means or unsure about it, what is our metabolism? You know, a simple thing, it's really just how well our bodies can generate energy. And right. you know, here we are, we're, we're talking and, th and we're thinking and we're using energy but we're not eating in the moment. <laughs> so we need some way to store fuel for later on and access that. And when it works well, we store fuel pretty harmlessly. It doesn't have to be weight gain and we can pull it out and not be tired and keep our bodies functioning. But you know, I, I, I wondered about this for years. I mean, how is it that someone can starve to death when they've got some rolls of extra fat, er, extra energy stored on their bodies. And, and so how is it that we, we've got these calories that are sitting here, uh, but our bodies aren't accessing them, and then, but other people can access them? Uh, you know, you're, you're kind of hitting onto the mystery that I wanted to dig into here. You know, think about this, someone, someone struggles with their, their waste or their dieting and you know, they get tired, they don't feel well, they're, they're exhausted, they're hungry. But yeah, like you said, all of us have got enough to get by for quite a while on if we could tap into it better. So, well, so that's a trick. So how do we tap into that better? Yeah, I've got this GM spare tire around my midsection. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know what? <laughs> this travel is getting to me. You know, I've, uh, my pants still fit, so that's okay. But but at it least looks, yours is not a, at least it's not a GMO spare tire. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, that's good. That's I'm good. pretty confident about that. <laughs> that's right. Well, I'm, I'm proud about that one, too. I agree. <laughs> so um, the way I've thought about um, metabolism, and you please tell me, you're really the expert about thyroid and about metabolism on this one. Actually, folks, when I thought I had a thyroid problem about two years ago, what did I do? I flew to Arizona to see Dr. Allen and had him examine me. And uh, uh, so this is how much I think of this guy, is that I flew from California to Arizona to have my thyroid examined by Dr. Allen. And this guy is the go-to guy. So- and of course, he's one of the healthiest thyroids I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> you say the nicest things. 
<laughs> so, so my thought about metabolism, and please help me with this one, is that every cell in our body, uh, there's two receptors, as far as I know, there's two receptors on every cell of our body, meaning two substances that every cell in our body will use. One is vitamin D and one is thyroid. And because thyroid, thyroid hormone is the thermostat on the wall that controls how hot the cell works. Mm -hmm. And that's your metabolism. That if your cells are generating energy, the house is nice and warm. You know, you're, you, you've got the fuel. But if your cells are not generating enough energy, if your metabolism is low, it might manifest as low thyroid or low energy. But it's the thermostat's turned down. We're saving fuel. Yeah. And most of us, most of us are carrying more fuel than we need to than we need to. So, you know, so we're saving more than we need. You know, that's all spot on. And you can think a lot about the thyroid, like you said, like a thermostat, or to think about like a car analogy, like the gas pedal, like how how fast are you going? And then in this one, I want to talk about the, the the storage part of that. So where are you storing it between usage? And some people are just running slower fast, but a lot of people they're they're not storing it well. You know, there's some ways you can store it that are really safe. You can pull it out when you need it. In other ways you store it, it gets stuck and the liver gets clogged up and that makes it harder to get to the fuel stored elsewhere. Well, you know, that gets right into it now and where, where we want to go today with it. I see there's a whole lot of hearts flying on my phone and, you know, uh, lots of hearts, lots of uh, awe, you know, um, uh, emojis and things. So people are really enjoying this. Uh, Sarah's in uh, west of Ireland and... Hello, Teresa. Uh, oh, ter from the Buckeye State, really? Really? Did you have to do that? You know I'm from Michigan, University of Michigan. <laughs> oh, really, Jerry? Okay. <laughs> Michelle's watching. Hey, Michelle. Uh, so, <laughs> so if I drop an apple on the ground and I pick it up, wipe it off, and I eat it, if there's some dirt on the apple, you know, when we eat food, it goes through if it's digested and absorbed properly through the walls of the intestines into the bloodstream, the first place that food goes and the only place it can go, there's no other place that it can go to is to the liver. So I've, I've always thought of the liver as an oil filter in the body. Yeah. And it's going to filter out any dirt particles that are on the apple. It's going to filter out anything that is not part of mother nature's idea of what, is supposed to be food for us. Meaning, you know, I think of it like a like a port of entry along those lines. There's like no other place to get in, and there's a whole lot of specialized immune cells that, yeah, that's where you interact with the outside world. Yeah, you know, the, the gut is still kind of outside the body, but once you absorb it, like you said, and once it gets in the bloodstream, then the liver is the first stop to check it out and see if the coast is clear or if it's safe or not. That's what the cup for immune cells in the liver do. Right, right. So for those that haven't heard me say this before. If you, you, your GI tract, your gut, starts at the mouth, goes to the other end, it's one big long tube. And if you could take a donut and just stretch a donut out and you look down the donut, <laughs> you want the food, it's in the donut. It's not in the body yet, it's in the donut. It's still outside of you. <laughs> it's gotta go through the walls of the donut to get into the bloodstream. And that's absorption. And that's intestinal permeability and all the other things that might happen that aren't good. But this donut, this tube, is, as Dr. Allen was saying, outside the body, mm -hmm. outside the body. And so what, only the good stuff is supposed to get through to get into the body. The rest is supposed to be eliminated. But our backup system, our gate of entry, our port of entry, that's really a great phrase for it, um, is the liver. So Dr. Allen, can you talk a little more about the liver? You know, pretty exciting stuff. So like you, it, like you said, it's, it's where things come into the body. The cells determine if it's safe or not. And they activate a lot of the immune response overall. But then it's also storing and making many things we need too. I think about it like a, like a big warehouse. Like, like you've got your own, I don't know, giant Amazon warehouse like right next door. <laughs> Whatever you need, you hold on to it there and you can make some things into other things. Uh, we'll, we'll pull out energy and fuel when we need it between meals. We store our vitamins and nutrients. You know, every second of the day, we're using scores of exacting chemicals and amino acids, but we're never getting them just when we need them. So that's that's the liver. That's the liver doing that. 
You know, if you go way, way back in our, our ancestry, millions of years back, at some point we were in the sea, according to the, the current science. And when we left the sea, our liver became almost like our filter, you know, our way of controlling the environment that we had inside of our skin. You know, and that's a, that's a great analogy. And, and the, um, uh, in nature, the, the way nature looks at our liver and how important our liver is, is that it regenerates, it's the organ that regenerates faster than any other organ. And it's you know remarkable. I remember reading studies about liver regeneration and, and uh, the doctors were, uh, were writing about that. If you have to take out a little piece of the liver, don't worry about it, it's not a problem, you grow some more. Uh, uh, it's you know, people routinely oh. donate half or two thirds of their liver tissue to appropriate donor recipients. And yeah, that's the expectation. Theirs will come right back again. So. You know, as we'll talk more, it'll be a story about how the liver is a center, center part about a lot of health challenges. But the good news, like you said, is that this is something that can fix itself given the right circumstances. Yes, yes, absolutely right. Well, we've got Laura from Seattle. Hi, Laura. Laura is part of our team. And thanks so much, Laura, for all your hard work. Uh, without you, I would still be stuck in some airport somewhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Alita's in Colorado, Annie's in Kitchener, Ontario, Maggie's in Boston, Glenda's from Texas, uh, Sabrina's in beautiful Oregon. She says, hello from beautiful Oregon. Yeah, it is beautiful. Sabrina. Really nice, Sabrina, thank you. <laughs> great, great, great. So um, the, the job of this filter then, when it's working normally and this filter, this uh, port of entry that stops things from getting in, when it stops stuff, what does it do with it? Uh, if it picks up some molecules, where do they go? Well, when things work great, it breaks them down into harmless smaller molecules and packages them up with proteins usually, and then sends them on their way, mostly through the intestinal tract in which they can leave the body. If it doesn't work out right, it may not break them down, or it may make them into worse byproducts, or it might try to send them out and rather go out through the intestines, they may recirculate or go out through the skin or go deeper in the body, you know, any number of things can happen. Right, right. You know, when we were first, when I was first learning about detoxification pathways and uh, Dr. Jeff Bland was talking about detox pathways, this was 1978, and he was talking about uh, phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver. And they're two very different phases. And and um, we, the easier one in the, those days to help with detoxing and breaking down products was phase two. So we would give these protein powders that had been shown to be effective in helping to break down phase two, uh, uh, helping to support phase two pathway and breaking down toxic chemicals and things. And, and every once in a while, someone would get really sick when they were doing it. And we'd call that a healing crisis. Well, it's a healing crisis, right? <laughs> no, it wasn't. We made a mistake. <laughs> you have to go phase one first before you start with phase two, because if you're breaking down these states, phase, you're, you're enhancing phase two, stuff gets partially broken down that should have been broken down in phase one. Yeah. So phase one first, then phase two, everybody's happy. And we don't <laughs> have those healing crises anymore. So. Uh, can we talk about, a little about detox pathways and what, what you've seen as a part of the emphasis that you talk about? You know, just that, you're spot on. And what happens a lot, too, is that there's, there's certain chemicals, there's certain compounds, but then this spills over into how the body can utilize fuel. And I talk about, you know, I, Tom, I kind of shy away from the term calories. I think they can be misleading, and I think there's a lot of baggage to how they've been used. So in the discussion, I talk more about uh, carbs, fats, even ketones collectively as fuel when we're referring to the liver, because they all break down to something called oxaloacetate. And so to the liver, they're not that radically different. And dietarily, they've certainly got differences and whatnot, but yeah, they're all fuel to the liver. And the pitfall is that fuel can be stored as one thing called glycogen, which we can make carbs into, or we can make too many carbs or fats or ketones or even alcohol into triglycerides. And the liver can store a lot more triglycerides than glycogen. 
And at some point it can get so many that are inside of its cells and around its cells that it can't detox effectively. So all these fat molecules of triglycerides are just sitting around in there and they start to pool together. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, what's that ball that people would squeeze between their hands? You know, that would, uh, it was like this, uh, would feel kind of gooey, but it, it exercise. Stick- yes. yes. I know what you mean. I don't know what that's called either. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. yeah like it's yeah. really body type texture or something, but yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so when you do a blood test and you're looking for cardiovascular risk, one of the markers is triglycerides. If you have too many triglycerides, you need to cut down on some of the carbohydrates you're taking in that may be contributing to the formation of the triglycerides, right? It's a good marker. Um, But there's a way of using your stored triglycerides for fuel and for energy. Um, uh, Do you wanna talk about that, Dr. Allen? For sure, so triglycerides, they're broken down by a process called beta oxidation. And that's one in which they're used for energy very effectively. If the, and that's the body's preferred way to break them down and the most effective. If that can't work, they can be made into ketones and ketones can be burned in parts of the body, but unfortunately not in the liver. So if the liver is really gummed up, then they still don't give it good effective fuel. But, but yeah, for some people, like you said, this stuff gets gummed up and it can also oxidize and then liver cells start to get damaged. And there's a thing called fatty liver, which is really common and on the rise these days. Yeah, unfortunately, I I remember a shocking statistic back somewhere in the early 90s that one third of the population in the U.S. had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Mm -hmm. Uh, a third of us. And I I think that's when I regrettably stopped eating onion rings. (laughs) 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 Uh, uh, Christine uh, Christine and Claudine both say it's a stress ball. Thank you. Stressful. Thank okay, thank you, guys. Yes, and Beppy Tan says, I'm here. All right, Beppy, welcome for being here. Okay. All right, Beppy's with us. We're ready to go. <laughs> so, so, guys, we're, uh, we're, we're going to be talking about Dr. Allen's metabolic reset program uh, here today, so you guys know what it is. So for those of you that can't stay for the whole show for some reason, and this is a show, I like saying a show. So if you can't stay for the whole show, then we posted the link there. Uh, so you can click on it and learn more. But we're, we're going to be talking about more about this thing about our metabolism and how do we burn these stored GM spare tires that we've got around our midsection <laughs> and that stuff off. So, Dr. Allen, you're saying that uh, people who are interested on, in keto diets, if they've read about them or they, they want to try a keto diet, the function of their liver has a whole lot to do with how successful they'll be? It can, for sure. Yeah, the liver is one organ that cannot effectively burn ketones for fuel. And there's, that, can, that can be an issue for some. You know, funny thing, but the, I mentioned how there's glycogen and triglyceride. And triglycerides burn best with some glycogen. And if there's too, too little protein or a lot of not, not, much muscle fast, not much muscle tissue to spare, and then no, no good carbs available, it's harder to break down that, that triglyceride. It's really true. It's very, very true. You know, um, uh, Mary says, uh, well, first, Dora says, my husband has seen plenty of NAFLD in his family practice in Houston. Uh, Absolutely. Any doctor in any practice, if they look for it, they're going to find NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because over a third of the country has it. You want to hear some scary scary numbers. Um, So some conditions are... There, there's simple ways to see when they're present. We talked about ruling in, like I, I'm looking outside and I'm seeing the desert. And if I, if I saw a rattlesnake out of my patio, I could say there's definitely rattlesnakes here in the desert, right? I could rule them in. But right now I don't see any. I can't logically say there's no rattlesnakes. I just don't see them. <laughs> Diseases are like that. So they're sometimes easy to rule in, but hard to rule out. And yeah. fatty liver, the only rule out is a liver biopsy. And that's not done just for healthy people for a screen with one exception. And that's if someone's going to donate liver tissue. So when healthy adults are planning to donate liver tissue to a loved one, everyone's got to make perfectly clear and be totally sure that they've got good, healthy liver tissue. So they do some blood tests. They make sure that they're not diabetic. They do a liver ultrasound. And if everything looks good for all those stages, they then do a liver biopsy. And in situations just like that, where they've jumped through all those hoops and they've been clear, 
40.2% of adults have been found to have fatty liver disease. After wow. everything else looks good. So it's wow. you're right, it's extremely prevalent. Wow. Well, that's it on those deep onion rings. <laughs> that's it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I grew up with A and W root beer onion <laughs> and black cows. <laughs> we had those, those were, in northern Minnesota too. <laughs> <laughs> those were really good. With uh, the mug taste. <laughs> right, right, right. That was the commercial jingle. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, Mary Mary Sloan says. So how do you know what's the state of your liver? Um, that's a really good question. And be, before Dr. Allen answers that. Um, I'm going to talk about something that we learned about uh, back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. It's called a liver blemish. Really easy to do. And, you know, if I press on my skin and I take my finger away, can you see the fingerprint mark that's there for a moment? Do you see that little whiteness and then it gets red? Uh, I, I can see it on my screen that it shows through for a moment there. I can see it on this end for you, Tom. Okay, good, thank you. So when you do that on your back, in between your shoulder blades, so the spine's going right down the center and just to the right of the spine, uh, in, uh, between the spine and the shoulder blades, and you push on there, so you push on there, and then you count. How long does it take for the white blemish to go away? And so you push, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, mine's gone. You push, one, 1,000, two, one, it's gone. And you go on the right side, in between the spine and the top of the shoulder blade, and then just go down along, parallel to the shoulder blade, maybe two or three different places, and you do the same thing on the left side. That blemish, because uh, what, what you're doing is you're pushing the blood out of the skin, so when you take your finger away, how fast does the blood come back in to bring color back to the area. It should take a second, maybe two, like it does here when I do it on my arm. But many people will take three seconds, four seconds, five. I mean, I've seen them go back as much as 10 seconds before that blemish goes away. It's called a liver blemish. And it's just this general easy screen that everyone should do. Now, the only time it doesn't really work is if you've been out in the sun that day. And so, you know, your skin's a little red or something from being in the sun. So aside from that, it should be one second, maybe two, three is okay, it's acceptable. But when it takes longer than that, it's called a liver blemish. And we did that every new patient that comes into the practice, right side, left side, and then a little stick drawing in the forms, the intake form, I would just put a little X where, and I'd say three, X, five, in terms of how many seconds, right? What happens there? What is that? So the, the liver is an oil filter and it's, it's designed like a honeycomb. This is how I think of it. There's thousands of little cells of the honeycomb and the blood comes through the honeycomb and the inside of those honeycomb cells is lined with cheesecloth. So as the blood from the intestines carrying the food and the nutrients and the garbage that we eat comes through the liver, the cheesecloth filters out everything that's not supposed to be there so that what comes out the other side of the liver to go on in the body is clean and pure, it's filtered. Well, where's the first place that that blood goes after it comes out of the liver? Right past that area of your back. So if you've got a, a dirty oil filter, if your cheesecloths inside the honeycomb cells are all congested full of bad fats or whatever, bad proteins, whatever it is that is being filtered, the blood's kind of sluggish coming out from the other side of the liver. So in that area between your back where you're pressing, the blood flow is gonna be a little slower or sluggish to rehydrate that area with blood. So you see that it takes five seconds, six seconds to bring that, um, uh, to get rid of that white blemish where you've just pushed on the skin. So that was a general screen that we started doing way back when I opened my practice in 1980. And we've done it ever since because it just gives us an immediate general idea. 
Dr. Allen, are there any clues that you use in your practice or that you talk about in your books that are similar to that? That's, that's a great one. One thing I do talk about that people I ask them to watch during the challenge is their resting heart rate. So lots of things affect that. But as you mentioned, the liver gets, when it's sluggish, it can block the flow of blood coming back up. So that can be a variable causing the resting heart rate to run higher for some people. Two other things, one is super easy is the height to waist ratio. So, you know, how tall someone is, throw some numbers out, say, say a gal is five feet tall, so that's what, 60 inches. So you want the waist circumference around the belly button to be less than half of the height. So 60 inches tall, you'd want to be under 30 inches for the waist. When that ratio is more than that, that's often a sign of the liver being too swollen. One, one other easy trick, um, almost anytime someone's had blood tests done, there's a thing called a chemistry panel. Uh, back when Tom and I got going in practice, that was called a smack. You know how they call these chem panels, but <laughs> they include right. liver function tests. And one of those is called ALT. And that's a specific enzyme that's almost unique to liver cells. And when they die, which they some normally do, they spill that in the bloodstream. Now, the pitfall here, if that's elevated, that certainly is a concern. And it may not be fatty liver, but something's wrong with the liver. But inside the range, this is something that liver specialists have agreed upon pretty strongly. Inside the range, if you're a woman and you're above 19, that's a sign that something is wrong. And it could be a medication reaction or a hidden infection, but barring something else less common, fatty liver is the first thing we think about. And the bizarre thing is that the normal range could be as high as 45 or 63 based upon your regional lab. But if you're right. above 19, something's wrong. Guys like Tom and I, we get leeway up to 30, but yeah, 19 and above for women is a flag of there being some kind of a liver problem. That's really important to know. That's really important. You know, uh, um, I've used the example of my godmother uh, that she passed from undiagnosed celiac disease that affected her liver. And uh, uh, so I talk about that uh, in detail sometimes. And we know that liver enzymes are a measure of dead liver cells, you know, and there's a normal number that you're supposed to have. It's the normal reference range. And for most labs, it's around 40s, and it depends on uh, the lab. It might go a little higher. But what you're saying is if it's above 19, but what, it's in the normal range, yeah, but it's above 19. Yeah. And that, that's suggestive that you, there's something going on in your liver, ladies. Yeah. And so that's an easy standard blood test. That test, ALT, uh, liver enzymes, there's three or four liver enzymes usually checked. That test is done in every physical, every blood every time you get a blood draw for a physical, and they say they're looking to see if you're healthy, they're looking for numbers, they're looking at liver enzymes as one of those markers. Yeah. And it's not a blood test for health, it's a blood test for disease. <laughs> that they're, they're looking for diseases, but there are some areas in there that if you know the science, you can fine tune, and this is a great example, that within the normal reference range, if the lab says zero to 40 is normal, and you're at 22, your doctor breathe, takes a sigh of relief. Oh, everything's fine. <laughs> but when you really have dialed this down with the experts like Dr. Allen, no, it's not. It's not fine. This is suggestive. If you're above 19, there's something cooking here. There's yeah. something wrong. So let's see what it is. Mm -hmm. Other pearls that you have about indicators of liver imbalances? You know, those are real big ones. Whenever we see someone to where their energy and their appetite never really line up, if they're, they, they miss a meal and they're completely exhausted or they're hungry and they should be after eating, those are, those are big signs of that as well. The body is not properly storing fuel for later and letting it out when it needs it. Yes, agree, agree. Uh, so uh, Karen Crandall's asking why on the back? Because that's where the, blood, that's where the blood is closest to the surface when it comes out from the liver. So that's the easiest way. Um, there's, there's no... Uh, it's not a diagnostic test. It's a suggestive indicator. It gives you an idea. Well, there's probably, it seems like you may have a dirty oil filter here. Let's look into this a little bit further. Right? Okay. And just like that, along those same lines, sometimes further along, people can notice small little spider veins. And that can be the legs or the, the trunk and those areas Dr. Trump was talking about. But yeah, little blue veins close to the surface can also be a sign of that liver creating more back pressure. And what... Um, uh, what do spider veins look like? 
Yeah, little tiny purple lines that have some bifurcations and divisions. So little ones along the surface that are just very thin and probably, oh, what, like a millimeter or so in, in width and maybe a couple centimeters long, typically with some forks on there. And they may be around the abdomen and near the areas of, of the liver. So if you've got any of those little spider veins going on, take a look at your skin today or tonight or after you take a shower. Just take a look all over your body. If you see some of that stuff, don't go, oh, my God, I got spider veins. No need to do that. Just say, oh, look, here's an indicator. All right, that means this reset program may be of value for me because the spider veins will go away. Your skin will clear up. Let me say that differently. The spider veins will go away. <laughs> so you don't have to get worried about it. It's great to see these little signs that tell you, maybe I should put a little attention on this one right now. <laughs> so let's talk about the um, uh, reset program. Uh, can, can you tell us a little more about it? For sure. So it's really made for someone in those situations to help get it to where just they're, they spontaneously have healthy waist size and better liver function and more stable energy. And, you know, what, what happened was that I am an uh, endocrinologist, an anesthetic endocrinologist, so I treat a lot of diabetes as well. And there was a protocol that was used for, was shown to reverse diabetes. And it was pretty astounding. It was well studied, showing that you could regrow the cells in the pancreas. And, you know, we like natural foods. We're kind of funny that way. And so this protocol used tiny amounts of poor quality synthetic foods, but they saw dramatic results. And I kept thinking, you know, if I used actual foods and, you know, whole foods and tried to do things a little differently, I wanted to test and see if we could get similar benefits for people and not have it be hard and not with weird chemicals. So we did, we would see great reversals of diabetes that were consistent, but also reversals of poor liver function. And the part that made it exciting for more general consumption was that people would come in and say, hey, I've struggled with these few inches for years. And, you know, maybe I could drop a few pounds, but the inches never go away. And now they have. And many people were seeing many, many inches and in, in just some pounds, but the inches were just so dramatic. And then afterwards, it was, it was easy for them to do the generally healthy things they were doing already, and they would get better results out of that. Well, that's really amazing. So that means that none of us will have to do the Jerry Seinfeld thing of going into the store and with a pair of scissors and cutting off the size 32 off the pants and take it home and sew it on our pants. So, <laughs> so, so that we think we're still wearing size 32. <laughs> I didn't know about that trick. No, let's, let's keep it from that people from having to do that trick. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we don't have to do the Seinfeld thing. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, for some people, it is really difficult to lose the inches and, that's because your metabolism is out of balance. So what Dr. Allen has put together is a metabolic reset. So what does the word reset mean? For me, the way I think of reset, I think of, you know, when my phone's acting up and I push on the screen and the button's not registering, it's, oh, really? I don't have time for this. But I have to shut down the phone, wait five seconds, and then turn it back on again, and then it works fine. What have I done? I've reset the phone. I said, okay, let's, let's start over. Let's just start over here. So that's how I think of the word reset. And Dr. Allen, can you tell us how that might relate to your metabolic reset program? I can't think of much better than that. <laughs> that was, no, that was beautiful. So the idea is that even more so than the phone, your body is designed to thrive and have you in vibrant good health. And when it's not, it isn't a matter of just you know, white knuckling it and pushing harder and starving and, and depriving or whatnot. Uh, it's a matter of helping the body work properly again. And I also loved your analogy, Tom, in the sense that you had to shut it off for a little while. And so the reset process is something that it's not steps that I would suggest you would do every day for the rest of your life. They're not harmful by any means, but they're meant for a specific purpose. So you get a job done, you make a change, and you can go back to things. I think most people that would listen to Dr. Tom, you know that broccoli is better than onion rings or French fries. And a lot of folks try really hard, but they're not seeing the results that they deserve from that. And, and that's why I'm excited to share a way in which your body can get itself back online again and work the way it did at some point earlier along in life. And what kind of results have you seen from people who have, who have done this? It's a seven day program, isn't it? 
there's, there's a seven day free trial that I encourage. The full program runs 28 days. My thought process is that, you know, I want someone just to be able to try it out and see if they're seeing some positive results. People yeah. see changes in the first seven days. And if someone didn't, they'd know that, that it wasn't a fit for them. But the part that I'm excited about, there's a lot of changes we see commonly in terms of the, the inches. Uh, we average about an inch and a half in that first seven days and average just about three over the 28. And then we'll see blood sugar. You talked about triglycerides. Wait, 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 wait. You just went past something. You said you average an inch and a half girth loss in seven days and yeah, three circumference inch. circumference around the belly button yeah so let's not just breeze past that that's like <laughs> what what well it's a big deal it is a big deal and i've looked a lot about ways you can predict someone's health outcomes and the studies i see suggest that that circumference may be bigger than almost anything else you know brain aging total longevity metabolic disease and of course we all like it to be for you know just aesthetic vanity but but just health purposes, health span, yeah. lifespan, it's yeah. huge. It's the biggest yeah. change there is. That's why I stopped right there because that's huge. Um, that's a big, big change. And it ties into the total inflammatory load in the body too. You know, we hear about the dangerous belly fat. There's even a worse version called organ fat. And so this is stuff that gets trapped inside the liver, not just around the organs, but inside the liver and inside the pancreas. And that's what we're really targeting is the organ fat and also the belly fat. And so we see that the healthy changes in waste, but inflammatory markers plummet. And I see people that have had their autoimmune markers come down consistently, arthritic markers, C-reactive protein, sed rate, chronic infections, and without doing the things you would think about for them specifically, but just getting that toxic fat out of the liver so when Dr. Allen says inflammatory markers plummet, mm -hmm. for, uh, for those of you that don't um, quite have the picture of that, that means you've all heard me say that every degenerative disease, almost every degenerative disease that I know of is a disease of inflammation. At the cellular level, the cell's on fire. And the question is, is it a brain cell or a kidney cell? Is it gasoline or kerosene? But it's always inflammation, almost always. And what he said here is that inflammation markers plummet, meaning they go down, meaning the inflammation goes away. It just goes away. And um, in seven days, the average is an inch and a half. And um, do I have to eat brown rice and sprouts during that seven day? <laughs> I mean, it's one of those weird diets. Nothing too weird. So I thought about this a lot and I wanted there to be a lower amount of fuel than typical. But the trick is, I want this to be not just a short-term win, but a long-term shift. So I want people to have better metabolism afterward and maintain their muscle mass. And then yeah. the liver, even though it's not getting as much food, it's, it's working even harder than normally because it's getting rid of all these stored toxins. So I wanted to give it a healthy amount of some clean proteins and appropriate micronutrients along the way. Marvelous, marvelous. You know, another indicator of liver congestion that we've always used in practice because there was a question here from Pauline James. She says, could you please address a congested liver and conjugation of estrogen, especially as it pertains to Hashimoto's and estrogen dominance? For sure. Well, I'll, let, I'll let Dr. Allen answer the technical part of that. I'm just going to talk about first, um, one of the indicators that we've looked for for a long time is if a woman has any indicators of PMS uh, with her cycle. You know, for example, just mild indicate, maybe just get sore breasts uh, before your cycle comes. Or some women say they feel like they've got tight brains, you know, they get headaches and it, or they just feel puffy. And that's water retention. And where does the water retention come from? One of the places it comes from is that estrogen is water loving. And you make more estrogen after you ovulate because that's when you, you can get pregnant. And so you want more water in water-loving cells to make a nice nest for a fertilized egg. And that's the uterus, right? So you're, when your estrogen levels go up after you ovulate, it's to make a nice nest. But if you're not pregnant, your, it's the job of your liver to be breaking down that estrogen just as fast as you're making it. 
so that you know it rises a little bit, but not so much that you hold all this extra water. You got sore breasts, you got tight brains, you got headaches. You know, you, you got emotional volatility from it. That's too much water retention. So what? Why would we be holding more water between ovulation and menses? Is because there's a more estrogen than there should be, because the liver is not breaking down the estrogen. It's the job of the liver to break it down, primarily the liver to break it down between ovulation and when your cycle comes. So that's just a general indicator. Anytime we'd have someone come in and on the questionnaires, um, there are a number of questions about hormone regulation and what are your cycles like and are they regular and, and do you have any symptoms? Do you get sore breasts or headaches, things like that? We know right away. And then if we've got a liver blemish on them, uh, this five seconds, six seconds, we know right away, all right, we've got to focus on resetting this liver. We, we have to get this liver detox so that this body can reset. So that's something I, I just want to make sure to mention that because we've looked at that for 30 some years now as just a general indicator before any blood tests are done and any other exams. Uh, Dr. Allen, please jump from there. <laughs> you know, funny thing, but our, hor our hormones are all made by glands, talking about estrogen coming out of the ovaries, for example. And we realized that the glands really just make very crude amounts of hormone and often much, much more than we need. And they just like throw a lot out and basically their plan is to let the liver sort through it and figure out what's appropriate for the body. Yeah. And when things work right, it can do that. But to be specific, what happens is that its ability to properly bind up and conjugate and package the estrogen in a way that it can leave the body that gets compromised. And if it's not packaged right, it goes into the intestinal tract, but rather than completely exiting, some byproducts of it come back in the bloodstream. So you get double dosed and then triple dosed, it might make that same loop again. So there are some diseases in which hormone levels are made at too high of an amount. They're rather rare and they're rather unusual. In most cases, when we're seeing overload like that, just like Dr. Tom said, the liver is not packaging not processing it correctly. And now you mentioned Hashimoto's. What was your name again? Um, bu 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 I'm here. Did Pauline. Pauline, Pauline James. Yes. Pauline mentioned Hashimoto's. So that compounds it. So thyroid hormones, they work two ways in the liver. They're activated by the liver and regulated the same way that estrogen is, but also they affect how the properties of bile are produced, whether bile is thin or too thick. And if thyroid hormones are lacking, the bile may be too thick and that further compounds this issue of the estrogen resorption. So, so yes, pollen liver can tie into both of those factors. Uh, Christine asks, could gallbladder problems cause the liver enzymes to be high? Oh, heck they sure can. Yeah, you know, your liver's making a little bile all the time and your body often needs a lot at once. And so when it works right, your gallbladder just holds onto it and waits and gives you a big shot when you need it. The thing I just said in that last bit about how sometimes bile gets too thick. So that can be one of the factors making it more apt to just drop out of solution and start making those stones which can block it. They can right. then block the gallbladder and the liver's still releasing bile, but it can't get out. And that can be harmful to the liver. Uh, Doris says spider veins are classic and varices esophageal and rectal. But yeah. by the time they have this, it's almost too late. No, it's not, girl. It is too late. <laughs> <laughs> She's right that those are signs that show up later than the test that Dr. Tom mentioned. But, but yeah, that's the beautiful thing is that liver conditions can be quite reversible. Um, Donnie, 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 D-A-H-N-E, Donnie Rodriguez says, please be specific what type of diabetes. Type 1 is not reversible. Mm. They, it's a common mistake. Well, I have to disagree with you, girl. Uh, there are many cases of type 1 diabetes being stabilized and people weaning down with their doctor's permission and guidance and many, some people off insulin. Uh, type 1 diabetics, a number of studies on it that have been published. And Dr. Allen, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, you're completely right. That's the study that I was referring to. I could have made, certainly could have made a distinction. This was, they were tracking type 2 in this study. But like Dr. Tom said, there have been studies saying that type two can reverse. And some of those reversals have been- Type one, type one. I'm sorry, yes, the type one can also reverse. And in some cases, those are from very similar approaches. 
And in other mm -hmm. cases, there are more general approaches that affect the whole autoimmune cascade because type one is very autoimmune in nature. Right, one of the things that's been shown to stimulate regeneration of the beta cells of the pancreas, those are the cells that make insulin. So for people that are not making much or any insulin anymore, regeneration of the beta cells of the pancreas can occur with fasting mimicking diets. And they've published on this, I've got two, two or three articles on it now. So um, uh, it is possible to stabilize and reverse the direction of type one diabetics. Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law thinks I walk on water because <laughs> one, because she's a, a, a type two diabetic um, and she was uh, insulin dependent type two diabetic. And she went from 20, I think it was 25 units of insulin a day down to four mm. within, within six to eight weeks. And she stayed there, lost weight, dropped her cholesterol, dropped her triglycerides because her body's working better again. So it doesn't matter if you have another, that she was type two, but type one, the same type of mechanism can occur. It's more challenging, but it can occur. Mm -hmm. So Donnie Rodriguez, I would just say, don't give up. Do not give up and say, and think that you're stuck for the rest of your life dependent on insulin. Now you take your medicine, hopefully you're checking your blood sugar every day to make sure that you're accurate. But when you implement programs like this metabolic reset program that gets your liver working better, that's a first step. And what you notice is that your blood sugar starts to get more stable as the mornings keep going on. You check it every morning. You find over the course of a week, two weeks, three weeks, you're getting more stable. Your, ins your blood sugar is lower. You need a little bit less insulin, a little bit less insulin, and you see where it goes. Here's a fun connection between uh, type two, especially in liver function. There's a lot of research calling type two diabetes primarily a disease of the liver. And they're also calling it leaky liver syndrome. That's been talked about quite a bit. So you just mentioned about checking your morning blood sugar. So unless someone is, you know, on Zolpidem and waking and eating and they're not aware of it, you know, most people are not eating when they're sleeping. So you wake up in the morning and your blood sugar is high, but you didn't just have a meal you know, where did that come from? Well, that's leaking out of your liver. There was so much fuel jammed in there that it leaked out too much. You needed some to keep your body powered, but that some became too much because it was overfilled. The other thing that we're seeing that's really exciting is that we can now tell the difference between sugar that you released and sugar that came from food you ate. For a long time, we thought that type two diabetics reacted badly to some foods and that after a meal, their postprandial blood sugar elevation was from them absorbing a food too fast or not regulating it properly. And now that we can differentiate, what we see is that about 80% of their elevation after a meal has nothing to do with their meal. It didn't come from their meal. It came wow. from their body overcompensating and releasing way too much. That's a really important concept, folks. You know, for, for your doctors, if you want to see how your doctor responds to questions, you just ask them. You know, Doc, after I eat a meal, does my blood sugar go up? Oh, well, yes. Well, why is it my blood sugar is going up when I wake up in the morning? I haven't eaten in the last six hours or eight hours. Right. Why is that happening? And they'll go, <laughs> that's a really good question. <laughs> so if that's happening for you, that is a slam dunk, slam dunk saying that you'll probably get some benefit from resetting your metabolism. Mm -hmm. And the first place you start is with your liver. And some of you know that I host um, uh, a week and, and two weeks in the Swiss mountains uh, every year. Last, last year, we did four weeks. And, and people come and they spend time there, a week there, or two weeks. And it's the same for everyone. Everybody starts with the same thing. And after Marzi and I did it, um, uh, almost two years ago for the first time, we were committed to do it every year. And that is a week of a liver detox program uh, because you just feel so different. Everything feels better. Everything, you, your whole body, your outlook, your, your vision, like the colors are more bright. I mean, everything about life has a new tone to it when your oil filter is working better. <laughs> so this metabolic reset program is just such an excellent idea and it's safe and it's, it's easy. 
Um, it's not challenging. It's not difficult. And, and we're doing it as a group. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to do this program. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Because my, uh, my GM spare, spare tire has gone from a subcompact to a midsize. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's why it caught my attention. Inch and a half, inch and a half in a week. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So that caught my attention right away. Uh, so I'm, I want to get back down to subcompact spare tires. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, let's see. Doris Men Mendiola says... Actually, type 1 diabetes can be improved to a degree in some folks with manipulating their diet, getting investigated by functional medicine. Thank you, uh, Doris. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, Mary Donald says, hello from the UK. Cheryl Duda says, hi, Dr. Brian and Marzi. Hey, Cheryl. Nice, nice to see you're here. Um, Lynn Trock says, sorry, I got here late. We'll have to catch the replay. Dr. C is awesome. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Thank you. you. Thanks, Lynn. I fully agree with that. Okay, so can you talk a little more about the RESET program? For sure. So we're doing a free week trial for that. And the basic format is to supply these nutrients, get enough protein. There's a lot of data about this thing called uh, decision fatigue. You know, if you've got to remember a lot of rules, it's hard to keep up with it. So I made some real healthy, clean shakes as the basis for it. And you can do these out of foods you've got in your kitchen. You can be paleo, AIP, even vegan and do it just fine. And the idea is doing a shake for breakfast and lunch and then a healthy meal for dinner. Everything's gluten-free and cutting out the GMOs and all the junk. And I also made it to where if the first few days you're a little more munchy, you've got some unlimited snacks you can make up. They're vegetable-based and some are, you know, just munchy and some are more savory. So you're just completely covered. Marvelous, marvelous. Well, that sounds like a no-brainer. It sounds pretty easy to do. Uh, <laughs> do, I, do I need a blender for that? Blenders make a big difference, yeah. And powerful blenders make it even easier. Yeah, so blenders do help. Yeah, great, great. Good to know, good to know. Because I'm on the road, I'm on the road. From, let's see, I'm going to Australia from here. So it'll be a few weeks before I can get started, but I'm going to do got this. Some, if you've got some good shakes with you, you can also just use shaker bottles if you've got some stuff with you right now. And it's totally an option too. Great point, great point. The funny Thank thing you. I've had a lot of folks say, Tom, that it's even easier during traveling because you only end up with one meal to figure out. And there's usually some pretty good ways to make that meal work well. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, Deanna says, I admire both of you and I'm so glad to see this interview. I hope I didn't upset you with my question. I'm just so curious and wanted to clear the Deanna, nothing is upsetting. And quite the only thing is upsetting is when you don't ask questions. <laughs> Um, and Deanna, I could have made that distinction because the study I referenced was type two, but I'm glad that Dr. Tom gave us even more hope and talked about the, some of the newer data. Yeah, yeah. And when you don't ask questions, I get upset. Why? <laughs> because you're going to walk away and not implement and not really wrestle with the suggestions we're making because something's in the way. Yeah. And it's a valid question, whatever it is, even if it seems silly to you, it's a valid question. So don't don't ever apologize for asking questions. It's like, it's like my godmother, I'm hearing my godmother right now. What's the matter for you? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, okay. Uh, let's see, Robert Cardacci says, hello. Uh, Amy asks, would this liver, liver cleanse be safe for children with your two shakes a day? I don't want to try to make them do that. You know, below teens, we've not studied that way. My practice has been on adults. I've not ex experienced with the kids, so we didn't study, study it that way at all. So I, I wouldn't recommend it for children. What, what I would recommend for kids is that shakes make great snacks. Yeah. When they, when they come home from school, give them one of these shakes, mm -hmm. you know, and have them help you make it. Say, honey, do you want raspberries or blueberries? <laughs> I want the blueberries. Okay, go get the blueberries. <laughs> out of the refrigerator or out of the freezer and let them get it, right? And then you're making it, but you get them engaged in the process with you. I'm, um, I'm much happier in the middle of the day when I have a shake. You know, if, if I haven't had lunch, I've been working or something, and I'm just barreling forward. If I take the time or if Marcy makes me a shake, you know, I'm just so much mellower. My body just calms down and I can focus more. Um, so... I yeah, think shakes. That's a great. That's a great idea. I love that. I think shakes are great for kids, uh, and yeah. have them help you make them. 
you know, young kids, those who are pregnant, those who are nursing, those are the only groups that we don't recommend the, the cleanse for. Good. And for everyone that's watching, the link is there. You can click on it to, to um, uh, register for the free seven days and, and uh, uh, give this a shot and, and see what you think. Mary asks, is this loss in circumference or weight a given with the program? I suffer with toxic liver, but don't need to lose weight. I struggle to keep my weight. For some people, I hear just that. And yeah, liver function can do better. And some people that do it don't need to lose weight. And it's set up to where one more insider part about it. Remember I said how a reset is not every day. I encourage less physical activity during this reset process, you know, more, more overall rest. And that's one of the ways to where if someone does not have weight they wish to lose, it wouldn't make them emaciated. That's a really good point. You know, a lot of people with um, observations similar to Mary's um, are exercising pretty aggressively. Mm -hmm. And, and say, so, well, I'm, ex I'm healthy, I'm healthy, but I can't gain weight. You know, uh, well, it may be you're pushing too hard, but that's a whole other discussion that we won't have today. <laughs> but the idea of just resting a lot during this time is yeah. a really good suggestion, really good. Uh, Tracy asks, if fibrinogen is high and no other inflammation markers are high and LDL and total cholesterol are high, any, any correlation to the liver? Hey, Tracy, that's a great question. There sure can be. That can also be an issue of coagulation, but with those other lipids being up, we would think about the liver. I would encourage you to look at your ALT and see if it was in that high normal range, but that can be a real common culprit for that. Agreed. And, uh, uh, most of the, the vast majority of cholesterol lowering medication works on your liver. And what it's doing is shutting down your liver's ability to make cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Your liver makes cholesterol. You got high cholesterol, your liver is making it. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why is your liver making it? So uh, Tracy, you've got high LDL cholesterol. And there's a number of reasons why that might be happening. So it's not that you want to stop that high cholesterol necessarily. You want to go back upstream a little bit further and ask, why is my body making high cholesterol? Yeah. Well, cholesterol is the raw material that most of your hormones come from. So if you need more hormones, and what hormones might you be needing a lot of for most people in this condition? Stress hormones. So if you're under a lot of stress and your body's demanding more stress hormones, you need the raw material to make those hormones. That's LDL cholesterol. You know, and along that point, one of the reasons your body makes extra stress hormones is because your liver is not effectively managing your blood sugar. So those stress hormones are part of the whole stress response, but they're also, they're actually called glucocorticoids, meaning they're, they're backup hormones to regulate blood sugar. Right, right. Good point. Really good point. The other reason, a uh, common reason for high elevated LDL cholesterol is if you have too much toxic bacterial crud mm -hmm. in your bloodstream. It's called LPS, lipopolysaccharides. So if you've got elevated LPS levels, I call it crud in the blood. If you get too much crud in the blood, you're going to have high LDL. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did not come out of Harvard. <laughs> Right in the blood-itis. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, Christine is saying estrogen after menopause, yes or no? Dr. As far as, I'm, I'm assuming the question is about HRT. So uh, there certainly are ways that it can be done safe and people that are appropriate recipients for it. There are versions that are more safe than others. And some people are not good recipients based upon their blood clotting of their family histories. So, so no across the board answer. Ironically, some populations for whom it's indicated will have lower risks of some of the things like breast cancer when they're treated than they're not. So that's a really good detailed discussion with a functional doctor who's focused on, on HRT. Uh, Doris says, Dr. Tom and Dr. Allen, y'all should teach my son's med school class. <laughs> well, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> that's really nice of you. Misty is watching. Hi, Misty. Uh, Misty runs the Scleroderma Support Group um, on uh, Facebook. Okay. Uh, Linda says, should I be taking bioidentical estrogen hormones after menopause? 
So same, same comment, there's that last one, you know, real, very personalized thing and relevant to the doctor's input. Right, right, agree. And certainly before we, we settle in on uh, hormones, um, adding extra hormones uh, 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 from medications, we wanna make sure our liver is working well. That's a prerequisite. Because Dr. Allen, have you seen changes in hormone levels after doing a metabolic reset? You know, for sure, hormone levels and hormone symptoms vary in a very big way. And that's what I was mentioning before about the liver's fine tuning all that. A lot of women, you know, their symptoms, they may have hot flashes or night sweats, and it may not even be a deficiency, but it's hormone levels being so erratic. So when right. the liver can get back in the game to buffer those highs and lows, oftentimes those symptoms clear up. Right, right. Uh, Lynn says, what about if you don't have a gallbladder? You know, great, great thing to ask about, Lynn. And the thought there is that I mentioned before how your gallbladder stores the bile for later. So in those cases, it can be harder to break down certain nutrients and even more important to have a nice thin flowing bile. So it's not going to congest within the liver itself. So this is not harmful for you. It's even more helpful and more important. Great. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, Donnie says, very interesting. I got my A1C down to 5.1 with low carb, but still need insulin. I've been T1 for 45 years. So mm -hmm. type one diabetic for 45 years. So, uh, you may need some insulin. That's a long time to try and regenerate. But, um, my experience has been Donnie that consistently people require less insulin. Uh, get your liver working well, do a metabolic reset, get your liver working well, um, look for food sensitivities, toxic chemicals, and the result is usually you have more blood sugar stabil uh, stabilization and better pancreatic function producing insulin. Usually that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But what Tom said, spot on. <laughs> uh, Amy asks, what does the keto diet do to your liver? Uh, there's a big bunch of responses and there's really no bad, bad things or miracle things. You know, my approach is to figure out if someone's tried everything and it's not worked, what's, what's most likely going to be helpful for them for the next step. And that's what this one's all about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cindy's from Pennsylvania says, sorry, I'm late. Well, glad you're here, Cindy. <laughs> uh, Trish says, you just returned from India. I'm still in India. It's 5.30. Oh, no, it's 6.30 in the morning now. So the sun's coming up. Uh, it's weird. You know, it's 13 and a half hours ahead. Wow. Of this 13 and a half hours. Where, where did that half hour come from? How does that happen? <laughs> I didn't know it was a half. I thought it would have been a yeah. whole number. That's odd. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, there's a half hour that's added in there. Huh. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, Sandy says, I'm not sure if I missed it, but where is this liver reset place they talked about? Uh, the link should be right on your screen, Sandy. Um, I see it on the bottom of my uh, phone link here. Uh, uh, it says uh, meta uh, metabolismresetdiet.com forward slash challenge dot php. So it should be right there. Uh, Ikaika says, what's your opinion on cricket protein for your shakes or smoothies? Hey, Ikaika, uh, I, it's high quality protein. You know, in the guidelines, I suggest certain quantities of protein, certain numbers of grams. And I don't know the grams per serving uh, on, on the cricket products, but if you're hitting the grams per serving, I know it's covering the essential amino acids, so you could do fine with that. Okay, Mary Sloan says, okay, got to run. This was great. I guess my waist says I have a problem. Fortunately, I joined the challenge today and your book is on the way. I'll ask this question in your group. I personally hate shakes and would sooner fast. Any problems? Any problems with fasting? Well, so the thought here is to help your liver. I mentioned before how your liver has to work even harder when it's detoxing. And even though there's less food coming in, it's still working. So we've got to feed it still. So this is a way to help feed your liver well, there's less food to help the waste coming out. Donnie asks, uh, I don't do starches. Can you do the detox without the resistant starch? You can. It helps it work better for most people. And starches are found in vegetables and all foods. You know, there's no way to actually avoid them completely. They're even in meat proteins, believe it or not, in some quantity. But you can do without. 
The perk about it is that it makes blood sugar stable faster and helps the belly flatten out more quickly for most people. Gary says, just ordered the book. Looking forward to it. Dr. Tom, slowly reading and absorbing your new book, You Can Fix Your Brain. Uh, way to go, Gary. And that's the way to read it is slowly. Um, um, and absorbing and it. So yeah, going through it and then acting on it. That's cool. Exactly, exactly. Uh, let's see, Claudine says, is there a test for the crud in the blood? <laughs> yes, there is. Yes, yes there is. That's what he was talking about. <laughs> right, right. Um, the most comprehensive tests that I've seen for intestinal permeability are included in the wheat zoomer test. Um, it's on our website, you'll see it there. Um, and also a great test for intestinal permeability is Cyrex uh, array number two. Um, both of those tests will look for antibodies that, and one of the antibodies it looks for is a marker of intestinal permeability is antibodies to LPS, this lipopolysaccharide, the crud in the blood. So the wheat zoomer looks at those antibodies and does Cyrex, but the wheat zoomer also looks at your level of uh, LPS in the blood. No, I'm sorry, it doesn't. It looks at the level of zonulin in the blood, my mistake. It looks at the LPS. They both look at LPS antibodies in the blood. Dr. Allen, are there other tests to look for crud in the blood that you use? You know, those are good ones. The coagulation markers can suggest that as well. There's also one that's taking a look at uh, the breakdown products of proteins that end up in the urine that can show if it's, if it's getting absorbed as well. Good. Indole, urinary indole tests. Agree. Those Agreed. are classic ones from back in the day too. <laughs> and that is, we used to do them in the office. Uh, every patient urine sample, we do indole on them, urinary indicants. Yeah. Uh, Ariana says, what AOT? Is it AOT forward slash SGPT? Some labs will do that. Mm -hmm. Mine was 30, 39. Oh my goodness. That was in 2015. Uh, Assuming uh, your feet, yeah, that's, that's higher than it should be. Sound mm -hmm. like a girl's name, so that, that's significant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Shiva says, hello, just watching and already registered myself. I heard recently about the liver cleansing with pure celery juice on an empty stomach. Do you recommend it as well? Uh, you know, we, we study this in a certain way. And it's a funny thing. I was just telling my doctors about this today. It's almost like we, we made a recipe and uh, we made a gluten-free cake recipe. And it's, it's a really good cake and it works out and it tastes good. And people will ask, well, could I do regular gluten flour? Or could I do leave out the baking soda? Or could I add in this? You could, it might not come out the same way. <laughs> so that's the same thing with this. We did a clinical trial and we've seen how this works. And we know, we know a certain predictable effect. And if we change it, it might work fine, but just can't say for sure. Michelle asked, what about if you're taking thyroid hormones? Mm, awesome question. I'm glad you asked that, Michelle. So nothing negative, but a little bit of the opposite. I would really love if you would check with your levels after you're done, because many people end up needing a little bit less or substantially amounts less afterward. And if that were the case, the amount that's working well for you now could be more than you need. So yeah, please do check after the challenge and see if you need a shift in your amounts. Elizabeth, E-L-Z-B-I-E-T-A, Elzbieta, Elzbieta says, it would be great to clean liver for spring. Isn't spring the best time for doing this? Yeah, this is a great time coming up early in the year. No, no bad time to do it. A lot of folks like to do that after the holidays and get things ready. Some do it in the springtime as well. What I suggest is that any healthy person, even if they're dialed in in all their ways, they do well to do it once a year. And mm -hmm. some people say, hey, I'm down you know, three inches and that's great. I'd love to see three more come off. And in those cases, I say, just do two weeks of more of a maintenance plan so your body can stabilize and then hit it again and get to where you want to go. Agreed, agreed. Wendy says, we can't click the link in the description. I would suggest a hyperlink, much appreciated. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I will make sure that's done next time. That's a very good point. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, Iris says, hi from Israel. What can be the reasons for too low cholesterol? Dr. C, we think it's terrific, but we know it's actually not a healthy situation. Um, I don't think it's, well, low is a term we've got to define. And there's a lot of data saying that if it's too low, it's not terrific. So. That can, that can be the case. And we're not sure if it's even specifically harmful or we know that in populations, we see certain risks higher when it's too low. 
So for like, some people, it may be normal and it may not be a risk, but for some, it can be. And just like we've been talking before, liver function can be related to that. The body right. makes cholesterol, right. and some people are more dependent upon dietary cholesterol than others. So some may be consuming too little, but quite commonly, some may be just undernourishing their livers. Agreed. First thing I would look at is liver function mm -hmm. for that person. Kim says, I get extremely sick from very minimal detoxing on approximately 10 medications. Is this safe to attempt? You know, Kim, check with your doctor if you're on, on a lot of medications. I did put a lot of thought and, you know, the word detox, I debated about even using it because there are a lot of ways you can aggressively stir things up, but not get them out. And this is done in ways to be very cautious and to be supportive of the liver. So most that have had issues with aggressive or even, even classic detoxes before, many have done well with that. Agreed, agreed. Okay, everyone, uh, we've gone over. It's uh, 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 been about 70 minutes. It's great. I mean, we can just go on and on and on. I know we can, but uh, uh, Dr. Allen, thank you so much for being here. Um, this is a great program. I've looked at it. I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, myself. Uh, I'll wait until I get back from Australia because uh, I'm on the road now, but uh, uh, I'm going to do it. And everyone that's here, I'd suggest you consider this. Try it for seven days. You've got nothing to lose. Just see how you feel. If you if your GM spare tire goes from a midsize down to a compact, <laughs> that'd be great. That'd be great, right? Beautiful analogy. <laughs> 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 All right, Dr. Allen, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to see you, my friend, and look forward to the next time we cross paths. Thank you. Happy to see you, Tom. Much love and safe travels. Thank you. Bye, everyone.